I think there's a drive that just says, I want to do the best that I can do. I was still working on the PhD in math. The thing about working in math is that there was nobody around that you could explain things to other than maybe three or four people uh, on the whole campus knew what my research was. Whereas with a pot, you can show it and, and lots of people can like it. And maybe they don't have all the technical expertise or anything like that. But I wanted to connect with people in a more general way. So I went and checked out a pottery course and there was this guy and he just um, said, you ever made a pot before? And I said, no. And he goes, well, you're gonna make a pot. There was nobody else in there and I think he was just totally bored. And so he sat me down at the wheel and wedged me up some clay. And after that, you know, a bunch of us took this, took this pottery course. They offered a pottery course at the Union. This old woman named Olive Briggs taught it. And at the end of the course, she said, you have to take a ceramics course have to go over and take the class at school. And so that fall, I took ceramics in September. And then at the end of a couple of years, I realized that I wanted to be a potter. I didn't want to be a mathematician. And so um, when I went to graduate school, then it was, all, it was all pottery courses and art courses. So, and then in two years, that, that was my graduate work was at the University of South Florida. In 1972, I graduated with an MFA, and, um, and then I set out to be a potter. The idea that I could make a pot and somebody would buy it, and they actually would want to buy it, just seemed like, hey, this is, this is the way to go. You know, this is like, um, how great is this? I had no idea that it was really going to be a lot of work and an incredible challenge over the years, and that, you know, I would have to, um, challenge myself in just about every way that is possible. But um, at the time, it just seemed like, hey, this is duck soup. They said the artist, um, you know, walks a fine line between like having this great desire to communicate and an equally strong desire to hide. And I, I see that in myself. I normally like to spend a lot of time alone, and yet I want my pots to communicate. And, and they don't communicate at a at a verbal level, they communicate at a visual level and also at a sensory level. You pick them up and they have, they have volume and they have weight and they, they mean something more than just looking at them. As the pot sits there, if it has spirit, that person that sees it also has access to that source. And that's, you know, that to me is what make us, makes a good pot. And it's not necessarily that it be perfect technically, though, I want it to be perfect technically, but, um, but, but it, it really has to do with, with something deeper than the technique. It, the technique is important, you know, it's important to have really good technique, although having fantastic technique doesn't mean that you make fantastic pots or fantastically spiritual pots, let's put it that way. Once you can transcend all of these technical issues, what sits there is simple. And I try to do that in my life. I try to have a simple life. I try to, I like to eat simple foods. I try to just have a simple life. That's definitely a theme in the work is, is the simple beyond complex. And organizing the studio and all that is all about um, making it simple to work in. The clarity of the space helps the clarity of the, the thing I'm trying to say. So that's, that's kind of how the space gets, um, it is cleaned up and, and, you know, and I'm constantly trying to make the space more and more organized. We spend, oh, a couple hours a week at least um, organizing the space. And it gets out of organization right away, but then we organize it again. <laughs> but the muse is really the spiritual path and, and having access to um, you know, the, the energy that's flowing, that is my muse. I think people think that I'm a scientist, and, and I'm not sure that I think I'm a scientist, 
But, but people do think that, oh yes, he's a scientist. He, he does all this stuff with glazes. And I suppose in a way I am. There's, I've done an incredible amount of empirical testing over the years. Well, I found out at a young age that I was colorblind. And while I still can see color, I, don't, I definitely don't see color like normal people. In a colorblind test, I miss about 19 out of 20. I always get the, the blue one um, on, the, on the yellow ground, kind of like this pot, actually. I make stoneware pottery, and they're my own glazes that I've modified so that I like them better. It's my own clay body and, and one that I developed over the years. And it's in, the, it's in a constant state of flux, which it is right now, because um, it needs to change just a little bit. The materials that come out of the ground are not constant, so I mix my own clay. So I get a container of water and I dump these dry ingredients in and I blunge them and then I let it set up and, and take the water off and, and then use it. So I'm not buying my clay prepared. I like making stoneware pots. There's just something about someone using one of my mugs or something that, that makes me feel good. Again, it's that sort of the feeling of wanting to communicate. At the same time, I, I work in porcelain, another clay body that I mix the ingredients and dry it out in the same way that I do the stoneware. And, and it is also a clay body in flux. It, it changes a little bit here and a little bit there over time. I'm really interested in these crystalline glazes and, and the porcelain is a very nice backdrop for these crystalline glazes. You almost need the porcelain. If, if you tried to put these crystalline glazes on stoneware, you would get too many nuclei. Every little bump would end up being a nucleus where in porcelain, the clay is so smooth. They're, they're every, every particle in the thing is, is pretty darn smooth. When you put the glaze on the pot, You'd like to have a, a semi-even coat, and yet a lot of this glaze is going to run off. So as you glaze the pot, it has to be thicker at the top because about half the glaze is gonna end up running into the catcher. What I'm trying for in these pots is to create these variegated surfaces, both in color and in foreground, background. And you know, I want them to look like really incredible universes on the surfaces of the pots. The crystals, when they grow, you have a growing period of probably 2100 degrees Fahrenheit to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in there. Here we go. Each temperature that you grow the crystal at, it's a little bit different color. There are just all sorts of variables. I, I can't say that, that I have a knowledge of everything that happens. And, and I think that's something that I also like about it, that there's, there's something about committing the piece to the fire, as you would do in wood firing or um, even gas firing, actually. But, but usually it's, it's much more like that. Like you put the piece in and it, it could be a real dog or it could be a masterpiece and you don't necessarily know beforehand. You can't really duplicate a firing even though you're, you're doing everything exactly the same. Things are different. Each of the pieces that, that I make has a number. Recently, I've, I've written a database. It's set up to where there are pots and glazes and firing is. And I can, I can look at a pot and I can tell which glazes are on it. And I can tell which firings it was in if it was in multiple firings. And I can look at a firing and tell which pots it was in. And I can look at a glaze and tell which pots the glaze glazed. So. So all of those things go back and forth. The, the, the way that you set up a database. Um, I worked for, I don't know, two months on trying to figure it out. Each pot is photographed and um, I have a little setup here where I, where I photograph them and they're photographed with strobe lights. And I've spent years and years and years trying to learn how to photograph them. And that photograph goes in the database. So, so if, if you see, when you go to a pot in the database, you see, you see a picture of that pot, so you immediately know which one it is. There are lots of people who have, you know, several pieces of my work, and, and I'm, I'm really incredibly appreciative of them. Just being able to know that, that they support this, um, this 
this gig that I have, you know, just being able to be in here and, and live this sort of quiet life. I think another thing about someone purchasing something that I make is that it's made here in this community where, where we've lived here for, um, some of us have lived here for 40 years and I've lived here for 36 years. People come out from town and they're here because it's a sanctuary and these pots are made in a sanctuary. The, another thing that just really opens my heart and, and hopefully that they can take some of that piece with them in each of these pieces. <laughs>